We're talking about hummingbirds. I was sat on someone's back porch one day and they had a bunch of the feeders for hummingbirds. And one thing I learned about them is they are very aggressive little critters and uh, they fight uh, to, to get that perch. And so um, we learned something about God, but thankfully our God is not quite like hummingbirds in that direction. He's a great creator, uh, but I do believe the fall has affected them in some way, making them very cranky. <laughs> little, little cranky critters we're thankful that our god is not like that so i'd like us to turn to act 16 please we're continuing to work our way through the book of acts we're over halfway and uh, we're want to uh, consider verse 6 down to verse 11 we're on the second missionary journey of Acts 16 verse 6 it says this now when they had gone through phrygia and the region of galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she brought besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So just to, again, remind us of, the outline last time we, as we looked at chapter 16, uh, we said the first five verses dealt with a new recruit for the missionary team. And if you remember, they uh, had had a big fallout over John Mark. Uh, Barnabas wanted him. Uh, Paul didn't want him. And so as a result of that, the group split into two missionary teams. Uh, Barnabas and John Mark went one direction and Paul and Silas went another direction. But they felt the, the need of an assistant, and uh, the Lord directed them to a young man called Timothy, who we learned last time would be very significant in the work of the Lord. And uh, one thing that I just want to say a little bit more about that little section, just a brief thing, and it's because of uh, events this week, really, made me realize uh, Timothy, uh, you know, we said that he, his family uh, wasn't ideal. His father was a Gentile, and we read of no spiritual input whatsoever into timothy's life from the father so I, I not the ideal family however he was blessed with a godly mother and a godly grandmother and they poured the scriptures into uh, little timothy uh, so that later on when paul came through and preached the gospel uh, it was uh, it all came together and that man was saved he already had a biblical knowledge now he had a new life in christ and he would be taken, uh, well reported to the brethren on the missionary journey. And so it just made me want to say something about the Christian family and the home again, because I really believe that the enemy is out to destroy the family more than ever before. I, I see such incredible, aggressive tactics to destroy the family. And just a couple of things that I heard this week. I'm not usually a radio listener. I'm not an auditory learner. I learn by reading. Uh, but I, I was traveling back from Wichita. And so I had the 
radio station on Christian radio. I was listening along and there was this uh, program and they were talking about one of the areas that's causing a lot of marriage breakups today is alcohol in the Christian home. Mm. It's interesting when I got saved, because uh, I was saved out of the life of a, a drunkard. And so I knew that I couldn't continue to entertain drink because of what I've seen it do uh, in my own family and uh, in my own life. And so I stayed away from it. But it was easy because I didn't know any Christians that drank alcohol. I didn't know any, not one. I mean, it was a rare thing to meet that. Uh, last time I was back in England, almost every home I went to, I was offered wine with my wheel, meal. And I was kind of shocked because that's not the environment. I remember how things have changed. And part of the reason they've changed is because, uh, well, we, there's this tendency to call people who say, you know, it's not a good idea to drink legalists. And who wants to be known as a legalist, you see? So, so, so this great liberty now. But one of the things that this man said, and he's a man who's counseled many married couples, is that socially it's perfectly acceptable now for Christians to drink. But what happens is drink is addictive. And so it doesn't just, you know, every alcoholic, if you want to believe that word, I, I don't believe it's a biblical idea, but every drunkard starts with just one glass. That's all it takes, just one glass. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is that uh, this man was saying that it's an epidemic now. And marriages are breaking up because people are hiding their drinking. You started out social, mm -hmm. but now they're doing they, they're dependent on it. They're doing it all the time and they're hiding it. And it just made me realize that if the enemy can get in one way or another, he wants to do so. Mm -hmm. And maybe you've got liberty. And if you have, well, that's I'm, I'm happy for you. But I just want to warn you because the Bible warns about it. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but instead... Be filled with the spirit. There's a much better spirit that wants to control you than wines and spirits. Amen. And it produces, he produces much better results. So again, just, and then the other thing that I heard, again, while well, my wife heard it, she told me about it and I was in shock. And that is this, that they are now finding that the fastest growth rate for pornography use is the under 12s. Through the phone. Mm. And so I just say all those things to say this. Please pray for Christian families. The enemy, and I, I do believe we met people years ago who were involved in witchcraft, and they told us they pray every day for the breakup of Christian homes. They are faithful to pray for the breakup of, we need to be faithful to pray for the protection and preservation of Christian homes and Christian testimony. So these are very sobering things. And, and particularly, you know, I, I think I'm thankful I grew up without a cell phone. They, they hadn't even been invented yet, at least that I know of. And the first ones that came out were like a brick, you know, I mean, <laughs> they were like carrying a brick around with you. Yeah, so that shows my age. But, but, but I'm thankful I didn't have to deal with that. There was enough to the things to deal with as a teenager, in, even in an unsafe home, without the additional temptation of the stuff that that phone can lead you into. So again, parents, be advised, be careful about your phones that your children have. And just, these are just some things. Anyway, I don't want to go down that line too much, but I just, just things that came this week made me from a, from a, from the heart of a shepherd uh, for God's people, feeling a burden about this. And we need to pray for, for families. Now, onto our passage not only was there a new recruit, there's now new direction. And so this section, uh, particularly verses 6 to 11, highlights God's guidance in the mission routine, and specifically the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we kind of look into how the Holy Spirit guides, I want you just to notice something. I'd like you to go just to Romans uh, chapter 8, just for a moment. Romans chapter 8. And where we learn something about the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, in this dispensation, this age, and Romans 8, 14, because this little section in Romans is called the Pentecost of Romans, because although the Holy Spirit's hardly mentioned uh, prior to chapter 8, when you get to chapter 8, he is mentioned prolifically. And in verse 14, it says this, 
for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And I just wanted to highlight that one of the marks of sonship is the leading of the Spirit. If you're a son and heir of God, you, you have the privilege of having this holy indweller actually guiding you and directing your steps and your movements in your Christian life. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, we believe that. I believe we've seen it at the Lord's Supper where the Spirit of God has clearly led the brethren and sharing. And there's been a theme that's gone through. And that there's no other explanation but the Spirit of God, right? We believe that he leads. But, but he also leads in, in terms of our service and, and where we're to go and how we're to, uh, to direct our ways. And so notice it says in verse 6, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, this is a very interesting thought, isn't it? Forbidden to preach the word of God in Asia by the Holy Spirit. Now, again, that tells us, you know, often people say about the Holy Spirit, we, we, we try to, in a sense, because the charismatic movement always talks about the Holy Spirit, like there's no other topic they can talk about, there's a tendency for us to go to the other extreme because we don't want to be, we don't want to be associated with some of the crazy things that goes on with that movement. And so there's a danger that we go to the other extreme and we play down the importance of the Holy Spirit. But what we can see here is that the Holy Spirit, although he doesn't speak of himself, right? He doesn't draw attention to it. He's always drawing attention to the Lord Jesus, but he does speak for himself. And he's very much directing the affairs of the local church and the early church. Uh, even these missionaries that were first sent out in Acts chapter 13, the Spirit of God indicated set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them, right? So he clearly directed. And now uh, he's directing the movements of this missionary team by forbidding them to go in a certain direction. And notice again in the verse 7, they tried to go into Bithynia. They came to Mysia. They are said to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And of course, the first question that comes to your mind is, why? Why did God, the Holy Spirit, by the way, who is a real person and a divine person, why did he stop them? Don't people in Asia and Bithynia need to hear the gospel? You would think he'd be all for them going into those locations, right? Because he knows this is a dark, lost world, and there are lost sinners everywhere, and there are plenty of them in Asia and plenty in Bithynia. Why not, why not send the missionaries there? Was there no need in these places? Was God not concerned that people in those regions should hear the gospel? And of course, God was. In fact, we know that eventually the gospel went to Asia, right? Ephesus, Paul went to Ephesus. Ephesus was in Asia. Uh, the seven churches in Asia Minor, right? Uh, there, there, there was a great work done in Asia. Uh, just look at First uh, Peter, just for a second, chapter 1 and verse 1. Notice what it says. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered abroad through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Remember, they wanted to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of God says no. But the gospel got there. And so it really wasn't a question of whether the gospel is to go to these places. It's obvious the gospel is to go to these places. God loved the world. He wants the message to go to every creature. Uh, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. God's plan is for every soul to have a chance to hear the gospel wherever their geographical location. So obviously, it's not a question of need, because there was need there, but it's a question of this. The Holy Spirit's timing. His timing was not yet Asia, not yet Bithynia, Europe first. The gospel is going to go to Europe first, to Macedonia in northern Greece. And so it, the timing... It is everything. And it is interesting how um, timing plays a big role in even people's readiness to receive the gospel, doesn't it? Was there times in your life when you just weren't ready? <laughs> and then when you were ready, God brought the message to you. <clears throat> See, he knows when people are ready. Uh, and it is interesting that uh, I hear that right now, uh, I know that Iran is notorious for what's going on at the moment in sponsoring terrorism. 
but apparently it's the fastest church growth rate in the world right now is Iran. Their day has come. And God is working marvelously in bringing the gospel to Iran. And here we are in North America, and it's kind of like the ground seems hard. It's all about timing. And so the timing was for Europe to hear the gospel. And of course, we might think about that in our um, own service for the Lord. Uh, you know, there might be a time for us to go somewhere, and there may be a time for us not. We need to we need to be just dependent on the Spirit of God to lead us. Now, of course, I, I guess the big big question is: Well, uh, how did the Spirit forbid that? Like, what? We're not told the details. Luke, Luke just tells us they were forbidden. Uh, so, how did that happen? Well, was it? by prophetic word, maybe given to one of the team, maybe one of the team said, you know, the spirit of God has really told us we, we can't go there. We, we don't know that. Could have been circumstances. Could have been a, a definite closed door. I mem remember years ago, there was a time when my wife and I were pl praying about going to Columbia. And uh, we were looking to the Lord about that. And we were praying and it, it, all of a sudden, all the visas just shut down. They were giving no visas whatsoever to Colombia, and so it was like, well, okay, Lord, if we can't get in, <laughs> we can't preach there, so we have to go somewhere else, so we ended up going to the Philippines, and there was an open door there, and then the Lord closed that door because of health reasons, and we ended up in Ireland when there was a wide open door at that moment for the gospel, and it's just amazing how the Lord works, and sometimes the Spirit says no, even though there are needy people there, and even though there are people willing to go there, it's just not the timing. And the Lord says no. And it's good to just accept that he's in control and he can direct us if we will allow him to direct us. And so notice verse 9. Having two negative messages from the Spirit of God, now they get positive direction. It says, and the vision appeared to Paul in the night there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, this is very fascinating. That You see, the reason I say it's so interesting is because Greece was kind of the, the idyllic man was the view of the Greeks. You know, they were... Well, they, they were cultured, you know, all the, the, the Greek philosophers and all the rest of it. They were athletic. You remember the, the, the Olympic Games? And, and, and so you have this idea that the Greek man is the, is the kind of the man who's got it together. He, he has it all, right? He's got the great intellect and the great cultured mind. He's got the great body and all the rest of it. So and yet here is a man of Macedonia, which is in Greece, and he's saying, we need help. Come and help us. Isn't that interesting? Because I, I think it's important that we understand, don't be fooled by what civilization tells you. You know, the Europeans, oh, they've got it together. Or even the Americans, you know, we're, we're the self-sufficient Americans. But let me tell you, all around us, there are people who may appear to have it all together, but actually they're desperately needy. We're so good at putting on a front. Like we've got it all together. You know, we, you know, we've, we, we've got the perfect physique like me, you know, and the, all this kind of, <laughs> quite, but you know, uh, but, but it, it's easy, isn't it? To give the impression we've got it all together. But around us, there are people who cry themselves to sleep at night. They don't have it together. Or they, when they get dressed and go out, they, they put on the perfect persona. But in reality, they're not like that. And so we need to recognize that all around us, there are needy people. And so he says, come and help us. And notice how they interpreted this in verse 10. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering the Lord had called us. And then notice what it says, for to preach the gospel unto them. I want you to notice that when this man says, come over and help us, the help that they understood that what that man needed was the gospel. It's interesting that a lot of, um, I don't want to be cynical, but so much missionary work today 
is kind of Christian social work. You'd be amazed at how much social work is being now. If it's done as a means of like a handmaid to the gospel, I can I can see that. But a lot of it seems like it's an end in itself. Even Israel, I mean, I, we want to be supportive of what's going on, but all the advertisements I'm hearing, it's all about helping them out physically. You know what they need more than anything else? They need the gospel. That's what the that's the need of the world is the gospel. You can fill their bellies. You can you can provide for their every need, and yet one second after they die, they're in an eternity in hell. What they need is the gospel. And so the greatest need of man, of modern man, of so-called we've got it together man, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the help they need. And it's the only help that will make a real eternal difference in their lives. And so they, they, assured, they assuredly believed the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And then as they make their journey... What we find is um, that the Lord blesses their journey. This trip, uh, it literally, it goes really smoothly because it says, verse 11, therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And so it just seemed that all the winds were favorable. Because later on in Acts chapter 20, they try to make the same journey, and it it takes them a long time to do it, five days to make the, the same journey. And so um, Acts 20 verses 5 and 6, it says, um, <clears throat> these uh, going before tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, and there we abode seven days. And so, again, what was a five-day journey, they did it in three. So it was like everything was favorable. But when they get there, they find um, the man of Macedonia wasn't waiting there for them with open arms and saying, oh, here I am. Come and give me the gospel. Uh, it didn't quite work out quite like that. It says, verse 12, they went to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. So just a few things about Philippi, named after Philip of Macedon, of course, Macedonia, right? He was uh, uh, actually the father of Alexander the Great, so a pretty significant individual. And uh, so it's named after him. It was a Roman colony, a piece of Rome transplanted abroad. And so the people of Philippi had all the, the full rights of Roman citizenship. It was like a mini Rome away from Rome. Yeah, that's how it was. It was, a, it was a Roman colony. And so the citizens of Philippi enjoyed the same privileges as those in Rome. And so it tells us that uh, as they arrive there, they're there certain days. What are they waiting for? Well, they're waiting for the Sabbath day. And remember we said that Paul, although he's a missionary to the Gentiles, Usually, he goes to the Jew first for two reasons. One is that, obviously, they already have two-thirds of the message. They just need the rest of the story. But also, a lot of Gentiles are disillusioned with paganism. And they're already beginning to come to the synagogues. Some of them just what we call God-fearers, like Cornelius, right? So there's, there's this growing movement where the synagogues are actually a gathering place of Gentiles who the Lord has already been working in their hearts. They, they've seen through the sham of paganism, and they're looking for something real and that will have an, a moral impact uh, on lives. And so they've, they've started to go to the synagogue. But when we come to Philippi, even though it was a Roman colony, there doesn't seem to be enough Jews in the city to have a synagogue because it says on the Sabbath day, uh, we went out, verse 13, of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And so as they made inquiries, obviously the answer was there is no synagogue because you have to have 10 men 
to have enough men to actually assemble a synagogue. If you don't have 10 men, you don't have a synagogue. That would close a lot of assemblies, by the way. But thankfully, it says two or three gathered into my name. Or else we'd be in serious trouble. But 10 men, 10 families, actually, was what was needed to begin a synagogue. And, and so instead, um, there were a group of women who came by the riverside to pray. Now, part of the reason they came by the riverside, because so much water is used in a lot of the Jewish ceremonials. And even though they're just women, they want to be as faithful as they can. And so the washings and the, uh, you know, the various things that they did, the various Jewish cleansing ceremonies. So they, they assembled close to a river and they were praying. By the way, uh, praying women can have a huge impact. First people they meet in Europe coming to look for a man of Macedonia is a group of praying women. That's a good place to begin, isn't it? Uh, they already are, are seeking God. There's already an interest in divine things. They're, they're calling on the name of God. And so that's a very good thing. And yet the one that particularly shows an interest in the preaching, it says uh, they spoke to the women which resulted there and verse 14 highlights one particular woman who pays attention. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So, I, ironically, if we're thinking of the man of Macedonia, the first convert in Asia was a woman, or, or in Europe, was a woman from Asia. Because remember the seven churches of Asia Minor? One of them is Thyatira. <laughs> so she's a blow-in. She actually is a foreigner. She doesn't belong there. She's there on business. She's a successful businesswoman. She's set up her but she's got a home there. We're going to see that, which she's going to use greatly for the Lord. And so she's moved there to conduct her business. Of course, Thyatira was known for its dyed garments and particularly making purple. And of course, that was used, the purple actually was used in the Roman centurion's garments, you see. So this is, this is a good business to have in a Roman colony, actually populated mainly by, by soldiers and ex-soldiers from the Roman Empire. So, so this is a good place to do business. And so this woman, this woman from Thyatira, this blowing, was a God-fearing Gentile who, like Cornelius, had abandoned paganism and to be, had begun to worship the God of Israel. And it said, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Only those who have had a similar experience will recognize what this means. When the Spirit of God just is speaking to you, it's like there's nobody else in the room. And, and you hear people they give their testimonies how they got saved, and they, they, they talk about, it's like there was nobody, it was like he was speaking direct to me. And it's like the words were just coming, and, and they, were, they were just revealing clar clearly the state of the heart. And so here she is, this, this woman, uh, She's gripped, her attention is gripped. Uh, the, the mind is aware of, of that God is speaking in a very clear, clear way through the word of God, and she receives it and believes it. And by it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When God, by his spirit, convicting the world of sin, speaks to somebody as if there's nobody else there, and they come under conviction, and they believe the gospel. And so we find that she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul, and then it says, and when she was baptized. Now, remember what we said in the book of Acts, that when somebody gets saved, they get baptized. And how long afterwards? Immediately, right? It's not a long day, a long delay where they have to have, you know, kind of uh, catechism classes and all this kind of stuff. No, upon faith, they're baptized immediately. 
And so she's baptized and her household. Now, again, we're not told what her household comprised. Most likely, being a woman of business and wealth, she probably had a lot of servants that also heard the word and believed it. But to say that there was babies there is a little bit presumptuous. Now, our dear reform friends love these household baptism passages because they love the idea of baptizing babies. But to read it into that passage is like saying, well, actually, they were all 16 years of age. Like there's nothing in the passage that would tell us what age they were. But uh, again, what we can say is that from, from the evidence of Scripture up to this point, usually the people who were baptized were those that had already believed. Believe and be baptized. Right. That's the message of Acts. And so there were people who had believed the message. Uh, and so she was publicly declaring the change which had just been had taken place in her heart. Her household also believed that would include the slaves and dependents. And again, there's not a shred of evidence that unbelieving infants were baptized at all. Then notice what she does. One of the there's kind of a couple of evidences of the reality of her changed life, a changed heart. The first one is she gets baptized. That's one evidence. People want to obey the Lord, right? Somebody's saved. You want to obey the Lord's command. And the first command is to be baptized. So she wants to obey that command. And so that's the first evidence. But the second evidence is God has opened their heart. Now she wants to open her house. And I want you to notice, it says, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now, remember, at this point, the missionary team has grown considerably. There's Paul, and there's Silas, and there's Timothy. Oh, but there's somebody else we forgot to mention. But he's there. I want you to go back with me now in the text to verse 11 it says therefore loosing from troas we came with a straight course to samothracia the next day to neapolis i want you to notice the word we there we so who's writing this luke oh suddenly luke is on the bus <laughs> he's joined in uh we see it uh again uh <clears throat> Verse 10, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia to preach, assuring that the Lord had called us to preach. So interesting, just to think about this. Remember, they wanted to go in this direction. The Holy Spirit says, no, go in this direction. So as they change directions, they end up in Troas. And in Troas, they meet a guy who's a doctor. He's called Luke. And he joins the team now is that just coincidental i mean if they'd have gone into bithynia would they ever have met luke i wonder but no they go to troas and there they meet luke and he's going to dispense some of the most marvelous medicine the world has ever known because he's going to give us the gospel of luke and the book of acts mm -hmm. and so again when you follow god's guidance it's amazing the things that can happen beyond what you'd ever imagine Actually picking up this guy called Luke and taking him with him on the journey is going to have huge repercussions as far as scripture is concerned. And I just find these things are very marvelous. So she's got four house guests now. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Now, no doubt that saved them a lot of money checking out of the Holiday Inn, four of them. I don't know whether they needed their privacy, whether they had four rooms or two rooms or whatever, but now all that funds that would be used in their lodgings were now covered at the expense of Lydia. Turn with me to the book of Philippians. You know, when we read Philippians, it's always good to think about the people that were in the assembly at Philippi. And, I, and as I read it, I was trying to remind myself that, yeah, there's Lydia in that meeting. And then later on, there's the Philippian jailer in that meeting. And, and, and maybe there's that demon-possessed girl in that meeting. And so they're real people that comprise this assembly. And Paul, as he, in chapter one, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. No doubt, 
as he's writing to the church at Philippi, he's, he's thinking of these people in his mind. He, and he says, uh, I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. And then he says this, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, I want you just to notice that. This is Philippians 1.5. Thanking God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And that idea of fellowship here is their investment, really. Uh, their, their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And so you get this idea that from the very beginning of this assembly, when did it start? Well, it actually started with Lydia. And from day one, that woman says, I want to invest in this message. And so what we can I do? Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can provide accommodation for the missionary team. In fact, my home can become the missionary headquarters for Europe. And they can, they can use my home. And so from the very first day, that assembly had participation in the gospel. It's good to have fellowship in the gospel, to participate in the gospel in any way we can. And again, one of the evidence of a transformed life is, yeah, we want to be baptized, but we also want to somehow be involved in getting this message that's changed us to others. We want to be involved in that however we can. Somehow show us how we can do that, Lord. We want to do it. And she found a very easy way and said, well, I'm going to open my, my lodgings to you guys. And so what an investment. Europe now has the gospel. Now, of course, here you are in America. But let me tell you, the gospel came here from Europe. So you should be thankful that the Spirit said, no, I don't go to Asia. You go to Europe. Because ultimately, the gospel came here, actually from Europe. In fact, even very directly here, because the two preachers that were instrumental in starting this work were both Irishmen. And so from Europe, it came here. Praise God for that. And we recognize that, that this was a great move, the gospel in Europe. Now, the sad thing is that both Europe and America have had the gospel for a long time. And much of the Christianity that first came has been corrupted and confused. And so there's a, a great need now for preaching afresh the true, simple gospel that alone can save. Are we praying that the Lord would lead, lead us to people like Lydia, whose heart is already moving in the direction, disillusioned, maybe with American society and the way things are and can see through it all. And they're, they're just, there's a void in their hearts and they're aching. And so let's pray that we might be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit and that he would lead us to people like Lydia, whose heart the Lord could open. And also, <clears throat> one thing that is interesting, that these, these men were steered by the Holy Spirit because they were already moving. Right? They're trying to go into Asia, in Bithynia. And, and it's much easier to steer a vehicle that is in motion than a vehicle that is stationary. You ever tried steering your car when it's not driving? The wheel feels real, even if you've got, you know, kind of uh, what I call that stuff, you know what I mean, the power steering. Couldn't get the word. Even though we got power steering, if your engine's not turned on, you try and it's very hard, right? When you're moving, it's easier. And so as we move as a group of people with this desire to reach people, the Spirit of God can clearly direct us. But it's much more difficult if we're immobile and we're not going anywhere. And so may God help us to be moving in the direction where we're saying, Lord, we want to go out. We want to share this message. We want to reach souls with the gospel. Show us how to do it. And once we get in movement, the Lord will clearly direct us. But if you're immobile, very hard to shift you. So may the Lord encourage us with this short passage and yet full of instruction for our souls. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful 
for the word of God. And uh, we're thankful for Lydia. And we're thankful for the, the evidence that she was genuinely saved, wanting to obey the scriptures by being baptized, wanting to open her home as, a, as it were a, a kind of a forward mission station for the gospel. And Father, we again just really pray that you'd help us to learn the lessons from this. We pray that all of us might know more of the direct leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives and service and actually be in a position where he can move us and direct us. And Lord, we, we want to expect to see you work in marvelous ways, just as you worked in these days, because we recognize your word tells us you're the same and you do not change. And so we can trust you to direct us and guide us in these ways. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.